Today's video is kindly sponsored by Bright Cellars, a monthly wine club that matches you with the wine you'll love. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. This fine looking vessel is the MS Munchen. At over a quarter of a kilometer long, she's roughly the same size as the Titanic and boasts a capacity of more than 45,000 metric tons. That's big enough to transport four and a half million good-sized badgers. On the 7th of December 1978, the Munchen departed from Bremerhaven, Germany, headed for Savannah, Georgia. A fierce storm had been raging across the North Atlantic for some weeks at the time, but the captain of the Munchen wasn't worried. His huge ship had been designed to handle stormy weather with ease. In fact, thanks to certain properties of her design, the MS Munchen was considered practically unsinkable. Some people never learn. So, unperturbed by the weather, the 28-man crew of the Munchen charted a course for the heart of the storm. But neither ship nor crew ever came out of the other side. I really enjoy cooking, and I have a little confession to make. I love to drink wine whilst I'm doing it. I honestly think there are few small pleasures in life that are better than cracking open a new bottle of red in the evening. So that's why I love Bright Cellars, a wine box experience that pairs you with wine that you'll love, delivered straight to your door. You start by taking their online quiz to determine your taste preferences with simple, fun questions such as your go-to alcoholic drink, your favorite juice, and your favorite kind of chocolate. They then, using their algorithm, match you to a selection of top wines that you're most likely to enjoy from around the world. Personally, I really like that Bright Cellars educates you about the wines you're drinking. It feels so much more intimate than store-bought wine, and it really makes each bottle a unique experience. And I love that it actually saves you time and money, because you know their wine will be delicious rather than wasting your time and money searching for a random bottle in the grocery store that might be no good when you get it home. You can try Bright Cellars today by clicking the link in the description box below. They're giving my amazing viewers 50% off their first six bottle box, plus a bonus bottle. Seriously guys, don't miss out on this unreal deal. Click the link in the description to get yours today. As the winds in the North Atlantic began to die down, a huge search effort was launched, involving 13 aircraft and some 80 ships. Traces of the Munchen were found, including several eerily empty lifeboats, but it soon became clear the ship had been taken by the storm. To this day, the giant vessel remains lost somewhere on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. An investigation was launched to uncover what could possibly have happened to sink such an enormous vessel. And what it turned up was nothing, or at least nothing that made any sense. There were no convenient icebergs nearby to blame things on, and nobody could come up with a plausible explanation as to how a vessel, considered practically unsinkable, could have been eaten by a North Atlantic storm. In the end, the investigation concluded that a freak weather event was to blame, which is maritime shorthand for, we literally have no idea what happened, but this is a mandatory field and I have to write something. The investigation did uncover one weird little detail though. One of the drifting lifeboats showed some severe damage to the launching mechanism used to release it into the water in an emergency. The damage seemed to imply that the lifeboat hadn't been actively launched by the Munchen's crew, but had instead been torn from the ship's side with enough force to bend this set of solid steel pins holding it in place. And that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Because the only thing in the middle of the North Atlantic powerful enough to bend solid steel, apart from the Kraken of course, was the crushing force of a huge wave. But while still attached to the ship's launching mechanism, the lifeboat would have hung some 20 meters above the water, far higher than any wave could have ever reached. Or at least that's what oceanographers at the time believed. You see, up until really quite recently, 
We humans were under the impression that ocean wave heights strictly followed a classical normal distribution, a bell curve. If that were true, the vast majority of waves in any given stretch of ocean should be roughly the same height as those around them. Larger or smaller exceptions would be possible, but increasingly unlikely the further they get from the average wave height. As you may know, wave height largely depends on three factors – wind speed, wind duration, and the distance over which that wind blows in one direction, also known as the fetch. Considering these variables, the MS Munchen should have been facing waves at around 10 to 12 meters the night she was lost. The idea that amongst those regular 10 meter waves, a 20 meter monster could suddenly have appeared to tear one of the lifeboats clean off its launching gear was considered so statistically unlikely as to have been essentially impossible. But not everyone was quite so skeptical, because despite what the maths said, there were rumours that plenty of experienced seamen claim to have come across random giant waves out in the open ocean. According to the stories, these so-called rogue waves seem to appear out of nowhere and far, far bigger than their peers, struck with enough force to sink some of the biggest, best equipped vessels ever built. Vessels like the MS Munchen, for example. But these tall tales were taken with a generous dose of sea salt by the scientific community. After all, the maths was clear. A random giant wave amongst a stretch of far smaller waves just wasn't a realistic statistical possibility. For that reason, the strange sinking of the MS Munchen was largely forgotten for some 17 years. Until, on New Year's Day in 1995, something remarkable happened that changed the way science thought about ocean waves forever. This minor maritime miracle took place at the Draupner Offshore Oil Rig, some 100 miles off the coast of Norway. A massive hurricane was sweeping across the North Sea at the time, bringing with it enormous waves. The rig had been fitted with state-of-the-art equipment, capable of accurately measuring the height of those waves. And as oceanographers of the day would have expected, each passing peak was approximately the same height as the last, around 12 meters which is about the size of a four-story building. But then, out of nowhere, the recording gear picked up a 26-meter monster wave, more than twice as tall and steep as everything around it. This mutant wave smashed against the oil rig, damaging structures that were never expected to be anywhere near the waves below. When scientists came to analyze the readings from their equipment sometime later, they were forced to come to a vexing conclusion. The Draupner oil rig had been struck by a wave so big, it shouldn't have existed. The Draupner wave, as it came to be known, was the first rogue wave ever recorded by reliable scientific instruments. It was the oceanic equivalent of a camera trap in the Himalayas, snapping a picture of a Yeti. A creature once considered a myth has suddenly been shown to be very real indeed, and scientists who'd confidently rejected stories of rogue waves for decades suddenly found themselves frantically revisiting their calculations. There was, however, still hope of scientific salvation. After all, extreme outcomes aren't impossible in a normal distribution of wave heights, they're just statistically unlikely. Some brave soul went away and crunched the numbers, and it turned out something as big as the Draupner wave should only come along about once every 20,000 years or so. Which raised an important question. Was the Draupner wave a statistical anomaly, an incredibly unlikely freak event, or a sign that our assumptions about giant rogue waves were utterly incorrect? That question wasn't only interesting to oceanographers and theoreticians, its implications were truly frightening. You see, the Draupner oil platform had been designed to withstand what scientists at the time believed was a once in a 10,000 year expected maximum wave height of 20 meters. The rig survived the blow with only minor damage, 
But it wasn't the only thing built to design standards based on the idea that very large waves were exceptionally rare. Pretty much every ship on Earth was too. In fact, most were designed to withstand waves of just 15 meters. If waves like the one that hit the Draupner oil rig were more common than anyone had previously thought, the majority of mankind's collective fleet was at risk. In December 2000, the EU launched a project called MaxWave to try and find out just how common these so-called rogue waves might be. As part of the project, they studied global satellite data covering a three-week period in order to carry out what was basically a rogue wave census. Despite the relatively poor resolution of the satellite images, the team found not one, not two, but ten rogue waves of 25 meters or more. It was a pretty terrifying revelation. And yet today we know that rogue waves, defined as waves that are twice as high as the so-called significant wave height of the waves around them, are far more common even than that. In fact, they occur every single day in every ocean on planet Earth. Some scientists believe as many as one in 3,000 waves go rogue. And just when you thought it was safe to go back into the water, one little quirk of the rogue wave mythology is that they appear to be a relatively modern phenomenon. The earliest mentions of such waves come out of the early 19th century. Considering we humans have been pissing around in boats for a good 10,000 years, that's a little odd. But then again, it probably shouldn't be all that surprising. When the Queen Elizabeth II, a cruise liner affectionately known as the QE2 to most Brits, came face to face with a rogue wave during a hurricane in the North Atlantic in 1995, her captain described the wave as resembling the White Cliffs of Dover, a literal wall of water that bore down on his ship with frightening force. The QE2 survived the encounter, but pretty much any vessel built before the advent of steel double-hulled ships in the 20th century almost certainly would not have. To put that another way, those who came across rogue waves throughout most of human history probably didn't live to tell the tale. Now, I know all of this sounds pretty scary. Thousands of ship-killing waves on the loose in the world's oceans and all that. But before you go and cancel that lovely cruise you had planned, Remember, a rogue wave is at least twice the height of its peers. That means it's only monstrous compared to the current sea state. If you're on a ship in stormy seas where the average wave is a 15 meter behemoth, a rogue wave could well spell your end. If, however, you're cruising through crystal clear and calm waters in the Caribbean, a rogue wave probably won't even make you spill your pina colada. On top of that, it's also important to realize that rogue waves are an exclusively fleeting phenomena. Unlike tsunamis, they don't travel across huge stretches of open ocean. They form rapidly and dissipate almost as fast. Common they may be, but you'd still have to get incredibly unlucky to actually come across one. So why do they form so fast? Come to think of it, why do they form at all? If the mathematics of wave formation suggests such giant waves shouldn't really exist, why do they? As I mentioned earlier, oceanic waves are largely formed by the wind, and you'd expect all the waves in a given stretch of sea to be subjected to roughly the same wind conditions. If you watched my recent video on the lighthouse keepers who went missing on the Flannan Isles 120 years ago, you'll already know what I'm going to say here. The truth is, we still aren't 100% sure what causes rogue waves. Some researchers believe waves traveling at different speeds can essentially join forces to create a monster, whilst others think intersecting currents might be the answer. But ultimately, there are dozens of different theories out there to choose from. It may well be that there is no single process that causes rogue waves and that many different sea conditions can coax those ship-killing giants into existence. As for whether a rogue wave sank the Munchen, it's widely accepted that this apparently unsinkable ship 
designed to shrug off rough seas with ease, most likely was indeed sunk by a monumental rogue wave. A colossal wall of water, perhaps 30 meters high, that reached up out of the night and devoured the ship. Unsurprisingly, the Munchen isn't the only vessel to have been sunk by a rogue wave. In the last couple of decades of the 20th century, more than 200 supertankers, greater than 200 meters in length, were lost to bad weather around the world. It's now thought that rogue waves were likely to be the major cause behind many of those disasters, accounting for hundreds, perhaps thousands of lives lost at sea. Today, scientists are studying rogue waves in the hope that by better understanding them, we might be able to predict when and where they're most likely to form. You know, to ensure we're nowhere bloody near when they do. But the processes involved are extremely complex, and predicting rogue wave formation in real time is going to be a significant challenge. Before I go, I have one more piece of exciting news for all you sailing enthusiasts out there. It turns out scientists now think super rogue waves up to five times the size of the waves around them might be a thing. Considering your bog standard rogue wave is apparently capable of sinking a super tanker with ease, we can only guess at the kind of devastation a super rogue wave would be capable of. But hey, if you ever find yourself on a ship far out at sea, watching the horizon darken like that scene in Interstellar, at least now you'll know what's about to kill you. You're welcome. And thanks for watching. Do you really enjoy my content, but you literally can't be asked to use your eyes? Then you're in luck because you can now listen to the new Random Interesting Facts podcast with me, 42, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll find a link to it in the description below. Check it out today and give your eyes a break. You're welcome.